This hour of the Costa Report is brought to you by Dole Food Company, the world's leading producer and distributor of fresh fruits and vegetables. Welcome to the Costa Report. I'm Charles Friedman. I'm your guest host today, sitting in for Rebecca, who I understand is somewhere in the air between China and India right about now. She'll be back in the driver's seat next week. And until that time, I'm Charles Friedman. I welcome you to this program. In just a moment, retired Marine Corps General and former CENTCOM Commander Anthony Zini will be joining us to talk about growing instability in the Middle East and what America must do to contain ISIS. General Zini is known for laying out the facts in a kind of direct, no-nonsense way you'd expect from a four-star Marine Corps general. So hang under your hats, because in the next hour, you're going to hear the unvarnished truth from an expert who was responsible for all American troops in the Middle East. But before the general joins us, let me tell you a little bit about his background. Anthony Charles Zini was born in Conshohocken, Pennsylvania. He earned his undergraduate degree from Villanova, his master's degrees from Salve Regina University and Central Michigan University. He's been the recipient of several honorary doctorate degrees. Upon completing his undergraduate degree, he was commissioned second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. This was the beginning of a military career. It took him to over 70 countries, including serving as company commander and operations officer, and the war in Vietnam, where he was wounded. But what you may remember most about Anthony Zini is his work as Commander-in-Chief of the United States Central Command, one of the highest positions in the military, also held at one time by Norman Schwarzkopf and Tommy Franks. Following his retirement from the Marines, General Zini was appointed to one of our nation's most important diplomatic positions, Special Envoy to the Middle East, where he broke ranks with the administration over how the war in Iraq was being handled. There isn't time to describe all of the commendations and awards that General Zini has received throughout his distinguished military and diplomatic career, so just let me say that he's among a very small group of leaders who have left their mark on this country's military history. It's my pleasure to welcome to the Costa Report, former Chief of CENTCOM and Special U.S. Envoy to the Middle East General Anthony Zini. Thank you for joining us, General. Good to be with you, Charles. Sir, if it's all right with you, I'd like to open the program by asking you to let people know the the, uh, chronology here. During what years did you serve as chief of CENTCOM? Uh, It was between 1997 and 2000. Uh, That's the the, the year before that I was the deputy there. Those were the years I was the commander. Okay, so this was during the, uh, the administration of Mr. Clinton. Yes, it was. Okay, and once Mr. Bush took over, what role did you then take? I was asked by Secretary of State Colin Powell to take on the uh, Middle East peace process, Israel, and the Palestinian territories, and I did that from 2001 uh, to 2002 uh, for the for the Bush administration. And um, undoubtedly, you got to know all of the key players in the area and keep uh, close touch and tabs on everything that's happening. I'd like to open the program then by asking you to comment on what we see now. There's a mass migration out of Iraq and Syria. In your view, is this the result of our failure to deal with Bashar Assad, uh, you know, the red line controversy? What should the U.S. response be? Well, I I think, first of all, the roots of the problem go back to the way we handled Iraq. Uh, I didn't think it was necessary to go into Iraq. Uh, We needed to focus on the uh, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. Uh, We should have put overwhelming troops in there, as we did in the first Gulf War. We would have probably gotten al-Qaeda at Tora Bora. Instead, we try to do it as an economy of force and a Renan army, if you remember Northern Alliance, and we lost al-Qaeda. And they went into Pakistan and metastasized, and in many ways, Going into Iraq and losing focus, doing it with too few troops. Uh, the original plan called for 380,000 troops. If you remember General Shinseki's testimony, which was on the mark. And, and that was required to seal the borders, control the population. We knew for a long time that if you went in and popped the regime, you were going to have a chaos. Uh, and a, a full occupation and control was going to be necessary. I think uh, the Rumsfeld Pentagon uh, was dreaming to think this was a liberation. And if you remember the the term, there'd be flowers in the streets. As a result of that, there all sorts of bad things came across borders. Insurgencies flourished. 
and we found ourselves in a long, drawn-out conflict that was costly to our treasure and casualties. Many of those who fought us in there went into Syria. And I think uh, our inability to really control how the governance system was set up in Baghdad, the one that led to Maliki, who did not uh, effectively include the Sunnis, he further alienated them. He mm-hmm. was part and parcel of the problems in dismantling the Iraqi army, appointing generals not based on merit but on cronyism. Uh, it kind of led to where we are now. Uh, I really believe that we now have ISIS firmly implanted in Iraq and certainly in Afghanistan amongst the witch's brew of uh, all sorts of, uh, of factions that are fighting there and, and will become worse if Assad goes too. Uh, and we have an obligation now, unfortunately, to handle this. And I don't think airstrikes and advisors and special operations is going to do the trick. Well, you've given a rather comprehensive view of the, the history of this. One of the things you, you didn't mention, and I love your views on it, in 2007, President Bush came to realize that the policy he'd been pursuing in Iraq wasn't working. He changed that policy. There was a surge of additional troop forces uh, that had been requested by, I believe, General Petraeus. And this led to, uh, to all uh, appearances, a success. And by the time Mr. Bush left office, the situation in Iraq was significantly improved. Uh, then in 2011, we subsequently withdrew completely, leaving behind no status of forces agreement. And since then, we've seen a devolution. Uh, what is your view on uh, on this? Do you see positives, negatives? Were there serious mistakes made? Uh, what happened, sir? Well, I think, first of all, you have to realize that uh, the surge was trying to fix something that was severely broken. Right. The dismantling of the Iraqi military, uh, us allowing the population split. You had alienation uh, of the Kurds and the Sunnis and some minor uh, of, of ethnic groups, the, the Chaldeans, the Syrians uh, uh, and others. Uh, it wasn't a matter of leaving troops behind. We would have left a very small amount that would have been supportive of the buildup of the Iraqi army, advisors, logisticians, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, The big, the key was Maliki. You know, we we never really had the right guy in charge in Baghdad. I mean, I wish we would have followed MacArthur and Eisenhower's uh, method of uh, ensuring the kind of government's governance system that was put in was responsive to the people, was inclusive, understood the need to reach out to some of the ethnic and religious groups that felt disenfranchised. Maliki wasn't going to do that. He was certainly uh, in favor of the, the, the a Shia domination. Uh, that allowed Ambar province and the, and the uh, Sunni provinces then to fade away. It allowed the influence to come back in, uh, much of the uh, what we see now as the insurgents in there, and, and then gave birth, obviously, to, to ISIS out of the remnants of Al, al-Qaeda in Iraq, the old AQI organization. I really don't believe that the, the fact that our troops left was the key. I really blame the administration for not controlling to a greater degree after all we spent in that place, who was governing and how they were governing in Baghdad. Wouldn't you think the two would have um, uh, kind of worked hand in hand? Uh, yes. The idea that you, you maintain a presence in order to maintain influence. Yes, well, yes, absolutely. Uh, I mean, to your point, uh, had uh, Maliki uh, was the one who resisted the uh, SOFA agreement status of forces, uh, but it wouldn't do you any good to have advisors and trainers and and, uh, support personnel in there if you had somebody in charge that intended to dismantle the leadership of the Iraqi army, you know, uh, give promotions and general officer rank to to those that uh, are not deserving and to allow Sunni participation in that army to fade away and not be credible. Uh, I was in Baghdad when Maliki was elected and and, uh, everyone said the key rests with him. Well, thank you very much for that synopsis. We will continue with this interview after our first break. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, stay where you are. When we return, we'll be talking uh, about what's happening now in the Middle East. You are listening to The Costa Report.
As a scientist who works hard to stay on top of current events and trends, I know how easy it is to get caught up in the details of a story and lose sight of the big picture. What is happening to society as a whole? Where are we headed? Why does it feel as if there's greater instability, unrest, and danger in the world? The truth is, very few of us have time to contemplate these questions. And if we're waiting for our leaders or the media to paint a clear picture, well, we may be in for a long wait. That's why I'm urging you to grab a copy of The Watchman's Rattle. Do it now. Go to RebeccaCosta.com. Find out why scientists, government leaders, and the heads of the largest corporations in America are waking up to a newly uncovered pattern of human behavior. That's The Watchman's Rattle at RebeccaCosta.com, a bestseller in 26 countries and a book that Richard Branson, Donald Trump, and experts everywhere are calling a must-read. That's The Watchman's Rattle, available at bookstores everywhere and online at RebeccaCosta.com. I'm here today with Scott Caraccioli. Where can people go to get Caraccioli Cellars wines? The best place is your computer and go to CaracccioliCellars.com and that's C-A-R-A-C-C-I-O-L-I Cellars with a C. Or if you happen to be in the Carmel area, visit our tasting room in downtown on Dolores. We're also available in many restaurants. We're distributed in about 15 states and we direct ship to about 30. So there's a good chance that we can get it to your door. And I will tell you that the easiest way to get the wine is to go straight to the website. It makes it so convenient to have it arrive at your doorstep. I cannot tell you how many dinner parties I've had where even though you're not that far away from me, (laughs) I've ordered by mail so that the wine would arrive in time for my dinner party. And it always has. Visit the Caraccioli Tasting Room on Dolores Street in Carmel by the Sea or find us online at caracciolicellars.com or reach us by phone 831-622-7722. Hi, Registered Pharmacist Ben Fuchs here. I've been studying healthy bodies for 35 years, and what I've got to tell you may shock and surprise you, but if you listen up, it may change your life. In a recent article from the journal Nutrition and Cancer, researchers explored the effects that diet can have on genetic expressions of cancer. In another article from the publication PLOS Genetics, scientists found that over 800 genes in patients with type 2 diabetes demonstrated an altered expression that was the effect of diet and lifestyle factors. This phenomena of genes changing in response to environmental factors is called epigenetics. Epigenetics is basically the science of how we control our own genes. Drug companies were shocked when this genetic flexibility was first discovered back in the 1980s and 1990s. Those were the glory days of pharmaceutical genetic research and what was called the Human Genome Project, an ambitious endeavor to map all the genes that were contained in human DNA. Drug companies were hoping to find genetic causes for illnesses, which they could then leverage into pharmaceuticals that could theoretically control those disease-causing rogue genes. What they were hoping to find was that one gene would do just one thing, but that's not what they found. Instead, they found that we are way more complex than one gene, one thing. One of the most powerful ways for us to affect our genes involves nutrition. This is called nutrigenomics, which can be described as the science of how vitamins and minerals and proteins and fats affect our genes. There's also an important mental component. That means we literally control our genetic destinies via our thoughts. Pharmacist Ben here urging you to go to kscohealth.com to order Beyond Tangy Tangerine, the Healthy Start Pack, and other nutritional supplements that I personally use and recommend. You can purchase these premium quality products at wholesale prices online at kscohealth.com. That's kscohealth.com. I'm the pharmacist that believes that staying healthy and strong is not only about medicine, it's about giving your body the raw materials it needs to do its work. Go to kscohealth.com. Make sure you check out the cool videos too at kscohealth.com that's kscohealth.com second portion of our program continues welcome back to the costa report i'm charles friedman sitting in today for rebecca costa our guest today is general anthony zini before the break we were talking about the combination of uh american withdrawal and flawed leadership from maliki causing a vacuum and contention in iraq that have now led to a situation in both iraq and syria the rise of isis and now we see this this exodus of people, particularly out of Syria and out of other countries, heading into Europe. Is there any way that this could have been foreseen? Oh, I think it was predictable. Uh, I think especially uh, 
uh, in the way we handled Iraq uh, and and the fact that uh, those that left Iraq and went into Syria added to the problem. Uh, we did not pay attention to Syria er, early on when, as a result of the Arab Spring, you began to see the resistance grow to Assad. Uh, now in Syria, all sorts of uh, evil organizations have come in there. You have this, uh, as I said before, witches brew of uh, ISIS, of Al Qaeda, of Al Nusra, and a number of others that we are unsure who is a so-called moderate and uh, who is an extremist in there. And of course, you have the government forces under Assad. Uh, even if Assad were to be defeated or to or, or to be overrun or removed in some way, I think you're going to have a continuing problem of of uh, civil war and violence and struggle that's going to go on for decades in Syria. It looks as if the Russians are beginning to take a hand there. We read uh, over the last few days of Russian forces and military hardware entering Syria. Is this a new opening of a front by the Russians in the Middle East? I, I think there's several motivations by Putin and the Russians. I think one is uh, they've made the judgment that if Assad falls, it's just going to be chaos and destruction. Of course, Assad was their old client. Right. Uh, I think uh, by exerting their presence and influence in there and, and possibly propping up Assad, uh, they feel they're undermining our authority and, and demonstrating uh, their ability to come back into the Middle East in a ma major way. So I think there's several motivations. One is geared toward us. I think one is geared toward propping up Assad, their former client. And, of course, there's probably a market in there for their weapons and arms, which they certainly can use given the sanctions that uh, we put them under. You know, as I look at this, I, I try to put together the various competing things going on. One of the interesting events which occurred as the administration was getting approvals to move, move forward on the Iran nuclear agreement was that Soleimani, the known Iranian terrorist, head of the Quds forces, a man whom the United Nations forbade from traveling out of Iran, defied that restriction. He went to Russia. He met with Putin and the Russian defense minister. Now we have this Russian move in Syria. Now, the timing of that, I'm wondering, in the middle of approving a nuclear agreement with Iran, as an expert familiar with Iran, do you make, uh, what do you make of these backdoor negotiations with Russia? Is this part of the result? I think it's absolutely part of the result. I think it's all planned. It, it, you know, Iran wants to extend its influence into Iraq. They certainly want to see uh, Assad uh, uh, survive. Uh, they are connected religiously with the Alawites. That's uh, the ethnic uh, group and religious group that Assad is uh, from. Mm -hmm. uh, and they they want to keep that arc in connection because it leads into Lebanon and Hezbollah and eventually to places like uh, uh, Gaza where they support Hamas. Uh, they were very interested in providing support to the Muslim Brotherhood in uh in, in Egypt, and of course Egypt's fighting its own uh, war in the Sinai and has to worry about Libya on its western border. And I think you see the hand of, of Iran stretching in, in that kind of arc all the way out to the uh, uh, extent of North Africa. And certainly, I think bringing in somebody like Putin and the Russians to aid them and support them, and I think the quid for the Russians, again, is to get uh, back to the kind of influence they had before during the Cold War in the Middle East, and they see this as the channel. Given what you've said uh, just in the p past few moments about expansionism or an increased reach on the part of the Iranians, let's talk about this nuclear agreement for a moment. There were 40 retired generals who signed a letter supporting it. Then that was followed by a letter from 200 gen generals who signed a letter opposing it. What do you make of these letters, and what's your position? Well, you know, first of all, uh, I, th I don't think anybody should be signing up unless they really are expert and understand everything that's going on. M my position is, look, an agreement's an agreement. It, you can't judge an agreement. If, if I make a contract with you to build me a house and somebody walked in just as we signed and said, is this a good or, be or bad agreement? My answer to you would be, wait till I see the house that gets built. Uh, so the agreement is a risk. It's a gamble in many ways. Uh, we're betting on compliance. We're betting on the motivation of the Iranians, which has to be brought into question. I think uh, we have to have the assurances, if I were a member of Congress, that tell me that we will know if they're cheating. And that doesn't only come through verification and inspection, but do we have the intelligence uh, sources to know if they're cheating that go beyond inspection and verification? Second and most important question 
is will those allies that signed on with us, those other five nations, will they reinstate sanctions if we detect cheating? Uh, you know, or will they have been c- corrupted enough because they're doing business and making uh, some money in Iran, be unwilling then to re- to enforce this. So, you know, I, I, and I don't think you're going to know the answers to these questions for a while. I would reserve judgment. I would I'd sign neither uh, with neither group, either pro or for, because the question is wrong. Is this good or bad? It's it, The question really is, is it worth the risk, and how do we mitigate the risk going forward in terms of detection and then being able to put in the kinds of punishment if, there, if we do detect that, that there's cheating? I also think there ought to be some way of understanding if this – has the possibility of leading to uh, opening up other diplomatic channels that we can work with Iranians. We have four Americans in there that we have to account for that are being held. Uh, Their support for extremist groups in Yemen and Syria, in in Iraq and elsewhere, in Hezbollah and Lebanon, uh, where do we go there? I mean, can this lead to another kind of dialogue? I mean, it all hinges on what the Iranians want to become. Do they want to become, uh, uh, you know, more... Uh, I think attuned to be to be a, a respectable country in the international community. Long way to go. There is one bit of hope here, uh, and that's the Iranian people. Uh, that's where I think the the greatest hope is. Uh, the hardliners may be, and I, I emphasize the may, may be losing power. I mean, the moderates and and the discontent in the streets because they've been under sanctions from Iranians I know that go back there and come back and forth. The, the Iranian people are tired of this and really want to see these uh, sanctions lifted so they can get back to some sort of normal life and, and be part of a, a respectable part of the international community. Maybe this will help that, that cause on their own streets. I think internally is where they may have the most concerns rather than externally and what we could do to them. Well, one of the things that you mentioned as a uh, a way to uh, ascertain whether the Iranians were com- uh, cooperating or not was intelligence. We've recently learned that uh, some 50 U.S. intelligence analysts have said that their reports are being um, falsified or at the very least uh, somehow um, altered before being presented to higher authority. When we get back, I'm going to ask you to comment on that so there's something you can be thinking about during the upcoming break. We'll have to take another short break, and we'll be right back with more from General Anthony Zini. You're listening to The Costa Report. Do you love creating salads as much as you enjoy eating them? Hi, I'm Amy Tobin, cookbook author and culinary expert. Dole inspires fresh and wholesome dishes for any meal with their wide selection of salad blends and all-natural salad kits. From the mild and tender texture of sweet butter lettuce to the crunch of classic romaine sprinkled with colorful shredded carrots and red cabbage, Dole has over 30 salad blends to satisfy every palate. If you're looking for the ultimate in convenience, Try Dole's unique salad kit combinations that include farm-fresh lettuces and vegetables, mouth-watering all-natural toppings, and specially made dressings. It's all you need to make a distinctively delicious salad. The possibilities are endless. Visit www.dolesalads.com for recipes and other ideas to feed your culinary imagination. It's the best-kept secret in Santa Cruz. The 60th Diamond Jubilee Santa Cruz Follies comes to the Santa Cruz Civic Auditorium, September 16th through the 19th. Matinees at 1 p.m. with a special additional show Friday night, September 19th at 7.30 p.m. Pre-show entertainment will spotlight great local Santa Cruz talent. Today's entertainment is three in accord. Don't miss it. Brought to you by your friends at KSEO and KOMY. Here's a September to remember thought for the day. The way things used to be is the way things are. At the Watsonville Auto Center, we're talking about the small-town values of honesty, integrity, neighborliness, and the low, low prices that only come with a low, low overhead. Now is the perfect time to discover those values at Watsonville Auto Center's September to Remember credit sale. 
Qualified buyers of new cars can get factory financing as low as 0%, and qualified buyers of used cars and trucks can get interest rates as low as 2.9%. Ten brands and dozens of new models wait for you at Chevrolet of Watsonville, Marty Franich Chrysler Dodge and Jeep, Marty Franich Ford and Lincoln, and Watsonville Cadillac Buick GMC. Take the short drive to the way buying a car or truck should be. Just off Highway 1 at Main and Auto Center Drive. It's a September to remember on Auto Row in Watsonville. When you see a dripping faucet these days, you run to the hardware store. But the real urgency may be the leaking we can't see. And that's the electricity leaking from the circuits inside our walls. But wait, if you can't see the trons leaking, how do you know you're safe? Let's ask the doctor of circuits, Chris Jensen from JM Electric. Chris, what can we do? Thanks, Charles. And yes, electrical leaks are a real danger. What you can't see can hurt you. You may not be able to see leaking electricity, but JM Electric's testing equipment can. Our state-of-the-art tools can find hidden dangers behind your walls. And JM Electric is happy to help folks out with a free home assessment to see if the current safe testing service is right for your home. Give us a call at 422-7819. That's JM Electric at 422-7819. Folks, don't let a leaky electrical system keep you up at night. Give my friends at JM Electric a call. They can make your home safe just like they did mine, and now I sleep better at night. Give JM Electric a call, 422-7819, or visit jmelectric.com. Tell them I sent you. Please join us every Thursday evening from 8 to 9 and enter Zero Doubt Zone. We seek truth, we vet facts, and we'll do it together. Zero Doubt Zone is calling all Americans to join an honest, open discussion of the important issues that affect us all. Together, we'll find the solutions to inform and empower the people. Every Thursday from 8 to 9 p.m., Zero Doubt Zone, only on KSEO, AM 1080, FM 104.1, and KSEO.com. Get involved. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Charles Friedman sitting in for Rebecca Costa today while she's in the air between China and India, I believe. Or she may well be on her way to Vietnam and Singapore, where she's also scheduled to make appearances. Now, for those of you who may not know Rebecca as well as many of us here do, well, I can attest to the fact that she's always on the go. It's not as all uncommon for her to broadcast the Costa Report from studios in various places around the world. But every now and then her flight is delayed or she runs into weather, as such was the case this week. So I'm happy I could step in and have the opportunity to speak today with our guest, General Anthony Zini. General, before the bottom of the hour break, I had alluded to recent allegations by 50 in odd intelligence agents alleging chicanery in the manner in which their information was passed up the chain. Uh, your observations on that? Well, uh, two possibilities here. One is uh, someone is either cherry picking the intelligence, in other words, just picking the pieces of intelligence that support their position or mm-hmm. view or one, uh, the situation look better or worse. Uh, the the other possibility, obviously, is that you have analysts from different either intelligence groups within the community or commands and intelligence groups that their analysis has come to different conclusions. You know, strangely enough, that's not uncommon. Uh, I've seen that. I saw that in Afghanistan when I was there doing an assessment uh, back in 2010. Uh, now, what's important is let's put aside for a moment that there's the chicanery that you mentioned. If it's analysts coming honestly to different conclusions, what's critically important is to find out why there are differences. Uh, you know, the, the process really involves collecting data, analyzing the data, and in many cases you have holes in the, uh, in the data you have, and so you have to use expert judgment. That's what analysts do. So, you know, who's applying what judgment, what background, what factors, making what assumptions? So I would want to get into this more to understand it. Uh, I saw very honest differences looking at the same bits of data where you couldn't draw a conclusion, so there had to be some uh, analytical assumptions made or analytical leaps in in judgment. And and that can happen when you don't have perfect uh, intelligence. So I'd like to know more how this works. I saw General Austin, the CENTCOM commander, current one, testifying, and uh, obviously Senator McCain was not happy with his testimony. He was, uh, you know, he brought up this point about the 50 
uh, analysts that uh, were objecting to that decision. So what's key is to find out exactly why we have these differences. One can be that somebody's manipulating the intelligence or putting a happy face on it. The other could be we have analysts coming to honest, different conclusions. Now, General, you've been quite vocal about a growing disconnect between politicians who order the military into combat and certain fundamental needs the military has to have to be successful, in particular, a clear idea of what the objective, the end goal is, once it's been achieved, an exit strategy. Could you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what we lack now, I mean, our greatest moment was during World War II when we had George Marshall and FDR and, you know, we had uh, we had top-notch generals and top-notch civilian leaders who understood what each had to provide. Uh, you know, the generals have to fight the war. They provide the operational design and, you know, the scheme of maneuver and how we're going to do it. But you can't throw them in there without a strategy, without a clear policy, a set of objectives. The obligation on the suits and skirts that uh, lead from the political top is to provide a detailed understanding of what they want to do, how they believe we should accomplish this, to provide the the strategy that we need, to set the policies in place that will make it happen, to gain the allies we need to support us, uh, to make sure the justifications out there. One of the most important parts is winning the battle of the narrative. The president has to give those fireside chats, those my fellow American speeches. Uh, We don't like to go into war with an American public that's either doubtful or turning against the operation, doesn't understand what we're doing. Uh, We need to convince our allies we're in this for the right reasons, with the right objectives, and it's winnable. And certainly that battle of narrative is directed to to the enemy, too. There has to be a clear understanding to the enemy that we intend to prevail. Uh, when that's lacking, and it's been woefully lacking you know, it, it, throughout this this whole business, going back through two administrations, so it's it's not a partisan issue. Uh, and and I think we na- need to relook at the role of commander in chief and all those associated with that in what they should be providing our forces before they cross that line of departure. So leadership and strategy both. You mentioned earlier about uh, the possibility of a regime change, I guess, in Iran, the idea that the people there are becoming rather impatient with the mullahs who hold unparalleled sway in that country, the theocracy that runs the country. Uh, We had somewhat of uh, an uprising like that back in 2009, uh, the Green Revolution, which uh, unfortunately was tamped down in place. Do you see a possibility of something like that being repeated any time in the future and carried through with successful results in the face of the revolutionary guards who operate at the behest of the Ayatollah and his henchmen? I think, well, first, the the Green Movement was a collection of very disparate groups that all had uh, gripes and complaints. It was not very cohesive or organized. Uh, It was looking to us in the West and the developed world uh, to, uh, for aid, uh, particularly, you know, just support for their cause and bringing it up. Uh, we were silent, unfortunately. Uh, I, I think that it, it, there was a heavy hand that came down on them, and because they weren't organized or weren't uh, cohesive enough, uh, they obviously were crushed by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard and, and others. Uh, I think the potential for that to happen again You know, should sanctions stay on and punishment come on and uh, as a result of them cheating on this agreement, as a result of the hardliners continuing the corrupt way they're they're running the government, uh, the economic conditions, the social conditions, the political conditions inside the country could give rise to that again. And, you know, pariah countries like this, eventually, internally, they're going to have a problem. This is not an uneducated, backward country. I mean, the Persians, the Iranians are an educated people, uh, you know, very civilized, and, and, and they aren't going to tolerate this kind of leadership and this kind of corruption and this kind of stifling of their ability to, to provide for their own representation and their own economic and, and social well-being. Thanks for that synopsis. Um, I'm curious to know, uh, we do have a few troops remaining in uh, in Iraq, and of course we have uh, forces still in Afghanistan. Much criticism has been made from time to time of restrictive uh, rules of engagement that they operate under. Would you please comment on the nature of those rules and whether you think they are too restrictive? 
I think they, they have been. Uh, one of the problems I saw in Afghanistan when I did the assessment, I was there in the 10th year of the war, and we had 10 commanders in 10 years. Could you imagine changing out the Eisenhowers or the Nimitzes uh, in World War II? We were changing them uh, virtually every year. And then every commander that came in had a different operational approach, and what went along with that was a, a different set of rules of engagement. And when I talked to the sergeants and the captains down where the rubber meets the road, there was confusion. They felt handicapped. The ability to, to clear fires, for example, uh, at the levels that are necessary for immediate response, where they are trained to do it, understand the implications of collateral damage, uh, that wasn't there. And, and it took time, it took clearance levels, and not an understanding by not being right at the point of the firefight. And I think we put troops at risk, if not lost some, because of those restrict, restrictive uh, uh, rules of engagement uh, that that in some cases actually the restrictive rules of engagement created more potential for collateral damage than, than had they allowed the normal rules of engagement uh, to prevail. Thank you very much for that. We'll uh, continue with this interview when we, uh, when we return from our uh, second break here. Pardon me, third break. Time flies when you're having fun. When we get back, I will be asking you, sir, about a strategy for fighting against ISIS. The testimony that you referred to the other day in a congressional committee indicated that many of our senators of both parties are skeptical that we have a coherent strategy for fighting ISIS. And frankly, many of just ordinary Americans feel the same way. I'd love to hear your idea on just exactly how we might be able to formulate such a strategy so that'll give you a little food for thought while we have this break right now you're listening to the costa report Big data is changing the way organizations work. From data-driven marketing and ad targeting to the connected car, big data is fueling product innovation and new revenue opportunities. It's creating a culture in which business and IT leaders join forces to realize value from all data. They infuse analytics everywhere and make speed a differentiator, gaining competitive advantage from faster, more informed decisions. Leading organizations are creating new business models, developing new roles, and defining new big data architectures, including an infrastructure that can manage and process exploding volumes of structured and unstructured data, in motion as well as at rest, while protecting data privacy and security. Find out how IBM Big Data and Analytics can transform your business. Visit www.ibm.com slash big data today. Biodiversity is the very fabric of our lives. It is everything around us, all of nature. But human impact is diminishing biodiversity at an alarming rate. And because of that, the intricate web of biodiversity is unraveling in ways we don't fully understand and our world is becoming less resilient. That's why we are biodiversity advocates. We're the E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation. Guided by the greatest living naturalist, E.O. Wilson, we champion research and education that expands our understanding of biodiversity and informs worldwide conservation efforts. The E.O. Wilson Biodiversity Foundation is building a movement of environmental stewards like you who share our sense of responsibility for the living world that is our home. Join us in our quest to protect biodiversity, the fabric of our lives. Visit eowilsonfoundation.org. Mid-County Auto Supply in Capitola is your complete neighborhood automotive parts and marine supply store. Whether you're looking for starters, alternators, impellers, water manifolds, filters, batteries, or car care products, our parts pros will find what you need. At Mid-County Auto Supply, we stock the highest quality DECA batteries, proudly made in the USA for the highest performance for your car, truck, motorcycle, or boat. We also carry boat trailer parts, towing supplies. We offer machine shop services. Just ask for Dan for all of your boating needs, and don't forget to ask JT for free fishing stories. Se habla espanol. Drop on by and visit our friendly professional counter staff for service you can depend on. 
From parts to waxes, we have it all at Mid-County Auto Supply. Open since 1970, Mid-County Auto Supply is located at 4310 Capitola Road in Capitola. Call us today, 476-3600. That's 476-3600. We're here for you seven days a week. For the last 60 years, Coast Paper and Supply has been serving locals and businesses for all their cleaning and paper supply needs. With an 1,800-square-foot showroom and nearly 5,000 products, you'll find everything you're looking for in the way of janitorial supplies, retail and industrial packaging, and disposable food service products for business or home, not to mention their huge selection of boxes and shipping supplies. Their family-owned and operated business is located at 151 Josephine on River Street in Santa Cruz. Call 831-423-3350 or visit Coast Paper Supply. Inc.com, a proud member of Think Local First. Join me for It's a Question of Balance with Ruth Copland on Saturday evenings 8 till 10. In the first hour, we ask questions that matter, focusing on the deeper issues underlying current events, politics, and our daily lives. Call in and join the conversation. In the second hour, we balance the intellectual with the creative by featuring in-depth interviews with local, national, and international guests from the arts. Tune in Saturday evenings 8 to 10 and discover it's a question of balance. Welcome back to the Costa Report. I'm Charles Friedman, sitting in for Rebecca Costa, who is traveling in Asia, where her book, The Watchman's Rattle, has created quite a stir. By the way, I've read this book, thoroughly enjoyed it, so I can personally recommend it to you if you'd like to learn more about how a sociobiologist views global events. Rebecca will be back for next week's broadcast. In the meantime, we are fortunate enough to have General Anthony Zini, former chief of CENTCOM, who oversaw all of our troops in the Middle East and who was also special envoy to the Middle East in the Bush administration, one of our nation's highest diplomatic posts. Well, sir, before the break, I I gave you kind of a heads up that I was going to ask about strategy against ISIS. Do we at present have one? Is it a good one? And what is your view of what that strategy ought to be? Well, I, I think the one we have is a high-risk strategy that has not been working. Uh, we're attempting to handle this. Uh, our own commitment is is just basically air uh, advisors, special operations. Uh, what uh, we are hoping that the Iraqis can produce a ground force that uh, would meet the necessary requirements. They have not been able to do it to date. Uh, we refuse to arm those that will fight, like the Kurds, sufficiently enough, the Peshmerga, who actually can take it to ISIS. Uh, we search around within Syria looking for, quote, moderate groups that might fight. That hasn't been too successful in the long run. Uh, and so we have now going on 15, 16 months, ISIS firmly implanted outside the gates of Baghdad and in almost all of western and northwestern uh, Iraq. Uh, and not coming to the resolution uh, or decision that uh, we need a ground force. Uh, And there isn't one on the horizon. And I think the tough decision, uh, and I know that doesn't play well with the American people, but we need to put troops on the ground, you know, boots on the ground. Uh, The first Gulf War, an overwhelming force, ended that conflict in a short period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, And we came home. And I don't think it takes that much. About two brigades, 10,000 troops, will gather probably another 10 brigades from nations in the region that will be willing to join us. They won't do it on their own. They don't feel they have the capacity. Uh, They need American command and control, American support. Uh, But I think if we were willing to do it, we would see, and I know this for a fact, we would see many nations join us. The first objective should be drive ISIS out of Iraq, give the time and space to the Iraqis, particularly in the Sunni areas, uh, to reconstruct themselves, time to build up their military, begin to move their military units in conjunction with ours on the ground to give them some backbone into the fight. And as they become more proficient, uh, obviously we would move in more into a reinforcing role and then eventually into advising and logistics and other support uh, uh, from a coalition force. At the same time, I would keep the pressure up inside Syria with air, 
arming the Kurds who are fighting inside there, and and even special operations uh, missions that go on. I think we need to think seriously about this refugee problem. We now have more refugees in the world uh, than we've had since World War II. There's something like 40 million, and that doesn't count, and they're mostly coming from Syria and Iraq. Uh, we need to find a way to, to a human, in a humanitarian way, uh, handle this, uh, or it's going to be a humanitarian catastrophe that's going to grow beyond what it is now. And, and I think we need to find areas where we can sustain these people and help them until such time as they can return. Uh, they're killing themselves trying to get into Europe. The, the welcoming mat is not laid out and won't be uh, in the near future. Uh, UNHCR, the United Nations uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, needs help and support. Nations need to contribute. We need to find places, humanitarian zones or whatever, to take care of them, not necessarily inside Syria, although we've done that before. I, I was involved in Operation Provide Comfort where we brought the Kurds back home after Saddam chased them out and created a protective area for them. Uh, that may be a solution. It may be one that has to be under a U.N. resolution and has allied participation and international support in structuring it in some way. But we need to start thinking about all the parts that are necessary. There's too much hope and speculation built into this that somehow a magic ground force is going to appear. It's not going to appear that way, especially the limitations we put on, like arming those that actually will fight and uh, you know, are credible in terms of, of, of not being extremists and willing to take the fight to, to ISIS. One time for one final question here. Obviously, we uh, we are nearing that time when we will once again select a chief executive. Now, I know that as a general rule, you like to stay out of politics, so I'm certainly not going to ask you uh, for your choice in the upcoming presidential race. But I did have a thought. Um, I was looking at a debate. What if they invited a general such as yourself to be one of the moderators who asks questions? What kind of questions do you think we should be asking these people who put themselves forward for national leadership? Uh, well, Charles, I love that recommendation, and I'll volunteer. Uh, <laughs> and, and I would tell you, the, the, my questions would be along the lines of, of, for each candidate, do you understand what the the job of commander-in-chief is? Uh, do you understand what's expected of you? Uh, do you understand what you need to provide for, for those forces you send into harm's way? Uh, I mean, I wrote a book about this, you know, where I talked about everything we need from the civilian leadership before we commit our forces. And it's, as I said before, woefully absent in, in, in recent years. Uh, and and this litmus test of you know, the commander in chief, it's not enough just to say, can you name a few names and pass a, a gotcha quiz on, on, you know, who is the president of Kazakhstan? Right, it right. has to be an understanding of what has to be put in place to understand what they have to do once someone tells, walks into the president and says, Mr. President, we have a problem. Uh, starting from how he assesses the situation, where he gets his information. Uh, how he hears options and what he can do, how he understands them, how he makes a decision, how he convinces the American people, allies, and the enemy about you know what's going to happen and makes his commitment about building a strategy, building a set of policies, uh, not letting politics interfere what needs to be done, setting a course of action, set of objectives, and then keeping his head in the game or her head in the game as this thing goes on, not not uh, staying distant from the battlefield and what's happening. Uh, and I can go on and on with those kinds of questions, but <laughs> basically it's do you understand the role of commander-in-chief? What do you think prepares you for this? What do you think that entails? Terrific advice. Now, I want to ask you if you have a website where listeners today can go to keep up on your activities. Uh, I don't really. <laughs> Good, activity, good for good no. for you. You have better ways to spend your time. I, I approve <laughs> thoroughly. Thanks, well, Charles. Well, listen. Thank you very much for for our conversation today. It was tremendously informative. I'm afraid that's about all the time we have. But I would like to thank you for the opportunity uh, of uh, being here, serving your country. Thank you, General Zini. Thank you, Charles. Enjoyed being with you. Appreciate it very much, sir. Now, if your station is leaving us after the uh, first hour. Uh, you have a question or comment you'd like to make about our interview today with General Zini, you can email me at RebeccaCosta.com or drop Rebecca Costa a note on her Facebook, 
Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. If you missed the full interview with General Zini, remember you can download today's conversation along with any previous episode of the Costa Report from the RebeccaCosta.com website, as well as Apple iTunes, Podbean, and the Costa Report's YouTube channel. Rebecca is currently speaking and signing books in Asia. She'll be back next week to sit down with former Congresswoman and nominee for the president, Ms. Michelle Bachman, where she'll explore the role the candidates' religious beliefs play in forging public policy. Don't miss the always controversial Michelle Bachman right here on the only news program that puts policy ahead of politics. During the next hour, you will be treated to 